We are moving into an entirely uh, new book. Uh, we've been looking at Nehemiah. And we're looking at a book now that fits in that period of time in between two books, as you'll see, Ezra and Nehemiah. And so we're looking at Esther. And it's a, it's the most remarkable book in some respects because you see, um, you're looking at a book that deals with, Ezra, first of all, deals with the restoration of the Jewish temple and the exile. So you can, we've talked about uh, that. And we've also talked about how Nehemiah is a book that deals with the physical and spiritual reconstruction of, of the people. So there you can clearly see that. But Esther is a book that is dealing with the preservation of the people. And so it's, uh, it's, and it's more like a drama than any other book of the Bible. It's, it's, it's filled with wonderful, unexpected plot twists. This would be, uh, I don't know why a good version of this hasn't been done. You wouldn't want to make it obvious and set it in the same period. You could do this in, in, in uh, maybe in China, ancient China, or you could do it in uh, Europe in this 18th century, reposition the book or something like that, or, or position it because it's an incredibly universal story and it's an Agatha Christie kind of a story. And it's a guy, ironically, is hung in his, you've heard the phrase hung in his own petard. You see, this guy's hung in his own gallows. And, um, it, but there's a delicious array of ironies about it because he goes before the king and he's full of pride and hubris. And he, uh, he's asked, um, uh, who would the king, what would the king do if he wanted to honor someone? Immediately he thinks he's talking about me, of course. Well, here's how you should honor the guy. And he says, now go and do this for Mordecai the Jew, the guy he hates, as we're going to see. So it's a wonderful twist again, and he's he's dying. And so there are back and forth movements in this that are the narrative structure is rich. So it, it really is more like a drama than any other part of scripture. It's these rich twists of, of plot. But let me go back a little bit earlier here, the introduction and the title. So as I mentioned before, the connection between Ezra 1 and, and Ezra and Nehemiah, it really flows between two parts of Ezra now in that period of time. So Esther fits in uh, in a 60-year uh, uh, period of time in between those two. So there's 60 years between Ezra chapter 6 and Ezra chapter 7. That's where Esther fits in. Zerubbabel's return um, and in Ezra, uh, his, um, his spiritual reformation, this book takes, in, takes, takes place between Zerubbabel and Ezra. So it just gives you a bit of a picture of the movement of the book. So I thought of what I'd do, though, is in our time together today, first of all, just to give you uh, something of a talk through this book and it, just to give you a feel for the movement of the book itself. So if, as I begin to do that, then we want to just talk about the message of Esther. And uh, you're talking about how the fundamental message of this book, as I see it, is that God uses ordinary men and women to accomplish extraordinary things. And that's a, a theme. This woman is unknown. And so we can see, as we're going to walk through this book then, how uh, the clearly emerging idea, that he overcomes impossible circumstances to, over, to accomplish his gracious purposes in our lives. And he does it in a wide array of ways. And so what we're going to be looking at, first of all, in the first four chapters, so I'm going to kind of walk you through the, the structure of the book, and then we'll look at chapter one. So just to give you a bit of the history or the, the overview, because it's a complex plot, as you'll see, but I'll just try to overview it for you. So first four chapters we could call threat to the Jews. It's the threat to the Jews. And then uh, chapters five through ten, we would describe it as the triumph of the Jews. So that's pretty much... The, the arc of this book. So the threat is overcome and then the triumph is, uh, follows. So the story begins in Ahasuerus's winter palace at Susa. And the king produces, uh, provides a lavish banquet and a display of royal glory uh, for the people of Susa. Um, and he proudly wants to make Queen, queen Vashti his queen, a part of the display. She's a beautiful woman, and he wants her to appear and make her beauty part of the program. 
but she refuses to appear, and this causes a dilemma, as we're going to see in chapter one. So the king is counseled to depose her and seek another queen, because after all, it's feared that if she and other women become insolent, then what's going to happen if Vashti goes unpunished, they're going to have, get ideas, you see, and then what are we going to do? So uh, Esther later finds, uh, so what they, he says, have a beauty contest and pick someone you want. So they appeal to his, his pride and his lust and so forth. This is a great way. Well, you, can, you can play people like harps, you know, as instruments. If you, you, the right combination of money, sex, and power uh, is, is amazing how you can do this. And commercials do this well. The better commercials relate the commercial, the product to all, um, two, if not all three of them even though it has nothing to do with them. It's very clever how they do that. But at the end of the day, the guy is, is, uh, makes a terrible blunder. But Esther uh, finds favor in the sight of Ahasuerus. So, so what we have here is that um, she... Uh, she uh, so what takes place is that Esther finds favor in the eyes of God, uh, eyes of Ahasuerus, wins the war- royal beauty pageant, and at her cousin Mordecai's instruction, she doesn't reveal that she's Jewish. And with her help, Mordecai is able to warn the king of an assassination plot. So he hears about this, overhears these people making a plot to, to destroy, to kill the king. He, re- he tells it to her, who has now become the queen, and she reveals it to him. <coughs> and we discover later that the event is recorded in the royal records but he discovers later on that Mordecai <coughs> was never honored for for saving the life of the king. So just giving a, more of a, on that. So meanwhile, Haman becomes captain of the princes, and Mordecai refuses to bow to him, and he, it drives him nuts because he's everybody's bowing to him and scraping, but Mordecai who refuses. And when he learns he's Jewish, Haman plots for a year. <coughs> to eliminate all the Jews. And his rage and his hatred grow, and he casts out, uh, casts lots, which are called Purim, and the uh, P-U-R is the word for for lot. And so that's, you're going to see this, this is where the origin of of this festival, of the Feast of Purim takes place here. This is its origin. It's not one of the commanded feasts of Israel, but yet it was something that was celebrated because of God's deliverance. Just as Passover is celebrated as a deliverance from their bondage in Egypt, and, and so a plot to de- exterminate them. This is another plot to completely exterminate and uh, annihilate the Jews. And so it's um, through bribery and lies, he convinces Ahasuerus, Haman does, to issue an edict that all Jews in the empire will be slain 11 months hence in a single day. Don't know why they wait 11 months. <laughs> But there's 127 satraps, uh, and that, that means that these provinces in, in Persia, huge empire, uh, going all the way to China from one end and all the way to Europe on the other end, it's massive. And he reigns over this in, the, in all these languages and so forth. So they send these horsemen out, these, these, these people, to deliver this message that's going to happen 11 months from now. You're going to get to destroy all the Jews and take all their property and possessions. And this has to be translated in every one of the different languages and sent out. So you can imagine the horror that, this, that ensues as a result of this as it goes around the, the provinces of Persia. And so... Uh, he uh, executes this with malicious craft. It states, uh, creates a state of confusion. And Mordecai asks Esther to appeal to the uh, to for to spare the Jews. And the peril of her life, she decides the king to the king. He hasn't seen you these thirty days, and then you will die if you go into the king's uh, uh, room. If you go into his um, presence unbid, you'll be carried out and you'll be beheaded. So she takes a risk, and unless he raises the golden scepter. And so when she comes in, he raises the scepter, and then he offers her, I'll give you anything you want, up to half of my kingdom. He actually promises this on three separate occasions. So she obviously had great favor in his eyes, but she's risked her life in order to present this message. But she does it with wisdom and craft. She doesn't just immediately blurt it out. She wants to, she throws a banquet. And she wants to have a banquet with just two guests. It'll be him, and guess who? Haman. So she's a very clever woman because she's going to set it up and to reveal 
the nefarious nature of this. And uh, so it's, she wants to dissuade him. And so what you see is um, Mordecai convinces her that she has been called to such a high position as this. So she was afraid to appear, but who knows if you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. And if you do not raise, if you do not act, relief and help will come for the Jews from another place. And that, then he says, who knows if God hasn't raised you to this? And that's a good question you have to ask yourself. That you, who knows why you are where you are, and he's placed you where you are, and there's a sovereign thing. The interesting thing about this book is there's no mention of the word God at all. He's never mentioned directly, no name for God. His footprints are all over it. But and the providential provision and and care is very evident, but you don't see him being directly. It's a very subtle book, and as I say, it's very unique. It's more like a a drama, a play than anything else, and that's why I think it could be really. I think it's great material, especially if you cleverly set it in another place and time, so that you wouldn't be an obvious biblical uh, epic. It would, I think it make it very effective. But at any rate. This is an astonishing uh, book in many respects, but she has this feast, and after fasting, and they, everyone fasts, and then she goes to the uh, she goes to Haman at the banquet. Um, she requests that they attend a second banquet. So this, she set it up first of all, and he's all happy and rejoicing with his friend. And he goes home and gives this little st- story about how his all his accomplishments and his wealth. Really, what a bore. But at any rate, uh, he loves to do that. And people, uh, the the fawning oleaginous sycophants that people can be, um, they 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 then they they do this uh, or Uriah heap that they play. You know, this 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 guy who's I'm mean, just a humble man and so forth. But this guy is just boasting and bragging, and people just go along with it because of the position that of power that he's been granted. So the grave danger is overcome, though, because then she reveals what's actually happening. And she, in the second banquet, she says, I wouldn't have brought this up if, if it weren't, if they were just going to be put into slavery, but the fact that they're going to lose their lives. And so, again, she, she reveals her origin and that her people and, and pr- begs for the king, uh, for, to, and to, to release them. Who has done this nefarious thing? Haman, this guy who's at the banquet. So she, it was all a setup there to reveal this to him. And so at the end of the day, uh, he is furious and he, he tries to grovel with her, trying to get her favor to protect me. And he kept, goes in here and says, is he he's even going to sexually harass her? So he, they, they, they go and cover, they cover his head and they bring him out to execute him. But then they decided, Where, why, why not put him on his gallows, you see? So they hang him on his own gallows, 75 feet high. You know, if a little bit is good, <laughs> more is better, and... Too much is just right. <laughs> he wants to make sure everyone would see Mordecai hung from that, so everyone gets to see him. And later on, his ten sons would also be hung. So the interesting, the ironic uh, twists and so forth. And she then gets the king to sign a counter edict because the, raw, the, the rule of the Persians cannot be violated, you see. It's, so it's in stones, but there is a counter edict where the Jews can defend themselves. And so they, have a, they successfully defend themselves in that time. And as a result, there's great celebration. And uh, the, end, the, the thing ends with a party, and it's the celebration of Purim, which is the Feast of Esther. And uh, the, so it's, it's the, again, it was, they were greatly delivered from this horrendous um, plot to exterminate them. And had there not been that alternative, the secondary uh, th- um, edict, you know what would have happened. They would have been, par- they would have perished. Same thing in e- Egypt. God delivers them providentially and they have Passover, you see. They celebrate that with a meal. Here, another attempt to ex- exterminate and to totally annihilate them, and it was a genocide that they were planning. And yet again, God delivers them, and they have a party. So I guess, I guess that's how there's a pattern going on here. You know, uh, they tried to kill us. We were delivered by God. Let's eat. 
<laughs> so they're so they're 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 kind of ce- they're kind of celebrating here. So um, as as I see this, then it's it's an amazing uh, it's an amazing book in respects. So it takes place in Persia. It's about a ten year period of time between four eighty three and four seventy three uh, B C, and so that it carries you through. Um, and the theme of the book and the purpose um, the purpose of this book was written how, to show how the Jewish people were preserved and how they were protected by their living God. And so it's a sign of how this happened, and it's a memorial. Even though his name is not there, you see the evidential, providential care written all over the book. And God disciplined his people, but he never abandoned them, as he, and he kept covenant with them. So the God of Israel is the sovereign controller of history. Providential care can be seen all throughout this book. He raised a, a Jewish girl uh, to, out of obscurity to become the queen of the, of the most powerful empire in the world. Secondly, he, provo- he ensured that Mordecai's loyal deed would be recorded because it turns out that when the king couldn't sleep, they decided his, his, um, his 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 soporific would be to hear the records of the court, so he literally had the court's uh, uh, records brought out so he could go to sleep. So that's why they were that's why they were reading it to him. But something caught his attention, and it happened to be that very event that happened with Mordecai. Has he been rewarded for this? He says, uh, "No, he hasn't." Who's in court? Haman came there early because he was so pumped up about getting fulfilled because he wanted now to ask the king to hang Mordecai on the, on the gallows. Who's in court? So Haman's in the court. And it was really early in the morning. So he was that uh, excited. So because uh, the king couldn't sleep all night. So what happens is he goes in there and he says, what should be done to the man the king wants to honor? And I already told you what happens there. And he's, he's horrified when he discovers it's not him. Take the king's royal donkey and, and put him on and put the king's robe on there and, and, and clear the way and, and the people are to bow to him and so forth. This is what will be done for the one the king wants to honor. Okay, good. Do it for Mordecai. <laughs> and it was a horror for him. So Mordecai's deed was recorded. Esther's intrusion uh, also was guided uh, into the king's court. God, over, super behind the scenes, superintends the timing of her two feasts as well. In addition, Ahasuerus uh, as, uh, insomnia, if it weren't that he needed a soporific. I love the fact that he reads the court records, though. That's a great way. Apparently, it worked before. It puts him right to sleep. <laughs> That's why he wanted to hear him. Um, but that, at that time, Haman's gallows would be utilized in a very unexpected way. And he gave Esther great uh, favor in the sight of the king. And uh, three times, as I said, he actually offers her uh, at this time and then uh, in each of the two banquets, whatever, what do you want to have done? Even up to half my empire, I'll give to you. It's a pretty bold statement. Um, and she wants than her people to be delivered. Um, so it, there's also the providential uh, new decree and the eventual victory of the Jews, and no miracles were involved, but it's a book that's filled with purposes. The events mesh together with obvious um, purpose. A slight change would have been affected the entire theme, uh, uh, theme of the book. So the theme is, I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you I will curse. I think an additional purpose was it was written to show that provide the historical basis for the back and background for the Feast of Purim. And to this day, this book perpetuates the memory of God's deliverance of his people uh, from certain destruction. So you can see in the history of the Jewish people, it's happened before. The genocide in in the second during the Second World War is not the first. Uh, so you you can see the the people to whom much has been given, much will be required, and um, they have suffered in a collective way more than any other people. Yet, and they're astonishing because it's an ancient people come back to their ancient land and speaking that ancient tongue again. That's never happened before. And uh, now, in this position here, as we would predict, if I read the New Testament correctly, Israel would be back in the land they would actually be ultimately building their temple and so forth. So just as we see predicted there, so it will be. 
Jesus, remember when he says, when you see um, when the abomination of desecration, so there'll have to be a temple that's going to be built in Jerusalem, and it'll have to be authorized by the Antichrist. And so all of these things come together. It's an amazing story about how God delivers his people again and again. And even there, um, as, as Leon Uris calls it, Exodus, you see, he speaks of that as the event that drew them uh, out of the world and brought back to Israel. So if, if it weren't for what had happened in the Holocaust, it wouldn't have happened. This wouldn't. So God is behind things, but he doesn't make people do things. You see, it's a fallen world and it's a wicked world. And ultimately, we are responsible. But God does allow certain things for a providential purpose that we cannot yet construe. And so at the end of the day, he's the one who has the authority to give life. And he also has the authority to take life. And by the way, you must recall this is true. Every one of us is going to die. It's not like we're surprised that we die. How did he allow this to happen? You're all terminal. The statistics are really impressive. Um, we say one out of one dies, except for only two occasions. And you know what they are. What are they? Enoch. And who's the other one? Elijah. My suspicion is those will be the two witnesses who, who are in the tribulation, because then they will also see physical death. So everyone will have tasted with physical, of physical death if that's the case. And they very much like Enoch and Elijah when you see the description of the two witnesses and that thing. So many things merge together. So you can't really understand Revelation very well without understanding Daniel and Ezekiel is, is and these are in the prophets. They all <laughs> come together. So you try to make a, um, a collective understanding and they're different narratives. And I know that there are different perspectives and prophecies. And some people hold that there won't, won't be a literal kingdom, a thousand year reign of Messiah, but rather it'll be a spiritual one. Uh, some people think that, uh, and those are, are called amillennialists. There are some who think that they, that we will actually bring in the kingdom, which is an astonishing thought. That we are the, the human nature being what it is, and we're going to bring in the kingdom, um, and that's postmillennialism, which died in 1914, as you might well suspect, with, with the the so-called war to end all wars, and it was not the war that ended all wars, but it revealed again the horror of the human heart, amplified by new technologies that didn't exist before, so that now technology is actually am, being a force multiplier for wickedness and evil, as we can see, is see on so many levels. But the point is that um, God um, uses these things for his purposes and for his uh, achievements. And ultimately, he has the authority to give life and he has authority to take it. And the real issue is going to be, what do we do about his offer? And that's the most astonishing thing of all, the offer that he gives us is salvation in Christ, um, which you could not have known in this time. So again, how do I put it? The old is in the new revealed. The new is in the old concealed. All these things that you're reading about here are pointers to Yeshua HaMashiach. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he spoke to all of them the things concerning himself. So as I, as I have put it before with you, that the inf that the in the inspired word reveals something you would have never guessed that the infinite word who made the heavens and the earth the one who holds the galaxies together that that infinite word who puts a face um, on infinity and eternity would become the incarnate word no one would have ever dreamed this or guessed it and you wouldn't have known that in the old testament either they did have two versions of messiah one the suffering servant one the reigning king naturally they'd plump for the reigning king the suffering servant who wants him <laughs> and so, uh, so, uh, but Isaiah 53 talks about the suffering servant, does it not? And what's very significant is most synagogues it, do not read Isaiah 53. It's too obviously about Yeshua HaMashiach. But the suffering servant then would be, have to be, he would have to die in order for him to give his life for the ransom, as a ransom of money. No one who ever dreamed or imagined that infinity and eternity would come on and take, take on humanity with undiminished deity. And do this not to re rule and to reign, but actually to, to suffer and to serve. Who would have dreamed that? The, the, the stretch of the love of the Father who sent his Son to do this. We're not dealing with someone who is wresting salvation from an, uh, an angry God. We are talking about a loving Father who gave up his Son in order so that we could have life. 
but who cannot violate his own and compromise his own perfection and integrity. He cannot do that. So the only way he could overcome that would be for him to bear the weight himself. And in doing so, he had to be the mystery of the divine God-man. Is it yet another mystery, the mystery of the Trinity and so many others, but the mystery of the, 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 the God-man with full humanity and undiminished deity. And, and he had to, as I've said you before and before, it's important to hear that you have to, he had to be fully man in order for it to be a blood sacrifice. But it had to be fully God in order for the sacrifice to be efficacious because he bore the sins of the world. And for and this one, with one sacrifice, sat down at the right hand of the Father, having accomplished all this. And now he has placated, he has satisfied the righteous requirements of God because God can be just and still offer salvation because someone paid the price because God cannot, uh, he, has, he cannot forgive sin. It is a moral world and nobody's going to get away with sin. No one's going to get away forever with evil. If you're an atheist, you cannot say that. You can, if you're, if I'm, if I were an atheist, I'd know for sure. It's guarantee people will live and they all go to the same place and they get away with hell. They get away with evil. They, it never caught up to them. You understand that? It's not a moral world. Only, and so they cry out, why is it, how could God allow this? Where do you get your idea of good and evil from if it's not from an absolute for good? But the absolute for good mandates that, uh, that if it's a moral universe, sin will be judged. Either you pay it yourself or, or I'm going to give you an option you never even conceived of, namely that I would take on your sin and give you my righteousness that you would have never conceived of. And why did I do that? Because I want to be with you forever. This, that's the father that we're talking about. And so this ma- amazing thought is uh, to realize that God in his purposes accomplishes all these things for his good and for his glory. Let's just focus in on our chapter. Um, so, as I said, Esther takes place in 483 to 473 during the reign of Ahasuerus, king of Persia. He's also, he's also known by the Greeks as Xerxes. So this would be Xerxes. We know when the guy lived. We have records and all of this. Again, it's not just some vague nebulous thing. We know where and when archaeology just continues to explore and give us more. The more we discover, the more we know how it, uh, how it authenticates, affirms, and amplifies our understanding of the scriptures themselves. Did you notice the three A's? I'm just saying. Um, um, when it, so it has you where it's known, as I say, uh, makes a feast, and I kind of went through the story already, the king commanders advise him to depose her and set an example throughout the empire. And so that's, uh, that's what we want to do is to depose her. Was the idea. And he displayed the riches of his royal glory and the splendor of his great majesty for many days, 180. Again, a little bit is not enough. He's got to do it all. So if we go to Esther, the banquets of the king and took place in the days of Ahasuerus, the Ahasuerus who reigned from India to Ethiopia, over 127 provinces. And uh, so it was the greatest empire at that time in the, in the world. So the Egyptians had been, had been overcome, and then the uh, Babylonians, and now the Persians have, ta- have conquered. They'd be followed by the Greeks, and then by the Romans. And, and Daniel would predict those, those uh, empires coming and going. But in those days, as King Ahasuerus sat on his royal throne, which was in the, at the citadel in Susa, in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his princes and attendants, the army officials, officers of Persia and Media, uh, the nobles and the princes of his provinces being in his presence. So we just get this picture of how he's going to be displaying this great splendor. He displayed the riches of his royal glory and the splendor of his great majesty for many days, 180 days. That's a that's a pretty lavish thing. A half a year yeah. of banqueting and par- I can't even imagine. <laughs> just think about this. And the booze flows freely and everybody gets to participate. I'm just trying to understand this. Where's this money coming from? But he has a, but he has 127 provinces and he can, and he can gouge them pretty. So, um, who was doing that? At any rate, <clears throat> the, the, when they were completed, <laughs> let me give another gang quiz at lasting seven days for all the people who were at present in this at the citadel and from in Susa here from the greatest to the least in this court of the garden of the king's palace so everybody's invited there were hangings of of fine white and violet linen 
held by cords of fine purple linen <laughs> on silver rings and marble columns. You get the picture here? It's, it was opulent. It was uh, sumptuous. Couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of porphyry. Marble, mother and pearl, and precious stones. So I'd love to see what that pavement looked like. You see, it was exquisite because it, it was a mosaic pavement. Porphyry, marble, mother of pearl, and precious stones. Wouldn't you love to be able to go back and see what that looked like? It's just the sumptuous richness and vastness of this wealth. Drinks were served in golden vessels of various kinds. The royal wine was plentiful according to the king's bounty. The drinking was done according to the law. There was no compulsions, for so the king had given orders to each official of his household. He should do according to the desires of each person. Queen Vashti also gave a banquet for the women in the palace, which belonged to King Ahasuerus, so she had her own banquet. Now, on the seventh day of this, uh, this special banquet, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, it took him that long to have to get merry with wine, he uh, commanded these, these uh, eunuchs, these seven eunuchs who served in his presence to bring Queen Vashti before the king with her royal crown in order to display her beauty to the people and the princes. She was beautiful, but Queen Vashti refused to come. She didn't want to just be some kind of a showpiece. So the king became very angry and his wrath burned within him. He said to the wise men who understood the times, that's a clever way to put it, and it's wise for us to understand the times and to know how we are to live as, as, as the men of Issachar. It was the custom of the king to speak before all who knew law and justice. And, some, and they were close to him, so he gives these names of these advisors. The seven princes of Persia and Media who had access to the king's presence and sat in his first place in the kingdom. According to the law, what is to be done with Queen Vashti because she did not obey the com command of King Ahasuerus delivered by the eunuchs? In the presence of the king and the princes, Memucan said, Queen Vashti has wronged not only the king, but also all the princes and all the peoples who are in the provinces of King Ahasuerus. For the queen's conduct will become known to all the women, causing them to look with contempt on their husbands. By saying King Ahasuerus commanded Queen Vashti to be brought into his presence, but she didn't come. This day, the ladies of Persian media who have heard of the queen's conduct will speak in the same way to all of the king's princes, and there's going to be plenty of contempt and anger. If it pleases the king, let a royal edict be issued by him. And let it be written in the laws of Persia and Media so that it cannot be repealed, that Vashti may no longer come into the presence of King Ahasuerus. Let the king give her royal position to another who is more worthy than she. And when the king, with the king's edict, when the king's edict which he will make is heard throughout all the king, great as, as it is, all women will give honor to their husbands, great and small. They didn't want any trouble at home, you see. Good luck, good luck on that. How, how'd that work for them the day after? <laughs> Don't think so. But they tried. They tried. Well, naturally, this word pleased the king and, um, and the princess. And the king did as he, and he sent letters to all them, to each of the provinces according to its grip and to every people according to their language. So, again, you, have to have, you had this whole brigade of people had to go out on each of the provinces and, and it own its, its own language, its own script, very elaborate system to pr proclaim these things so that every man should be the master of his own house and the one who speaks the language of his own people. And, and, and so there you have it. So they seek his, her successor there, and I want to just open it up and see what your thoughts and questions are, because it's a pretty straightforward account, this first chapter, but I wanted just to give you the perspectives on this. So you can see um, uh, uh, this, the narrative is set up and the, um, the playwright, as it were, prepares the stage um, and gives us this arrogant uh, character who can be manipulated, therefore, by other arrogant characters. You see, there are others who know how to manipulate um, uh, high deeds, you see, and there are people who can do that very well. And they can appeal to their pride, and they're very clay, cagey and clever. And though they don't have to be a, a immediately and directly boisterous or pushy, they have a way of co kind of playing them by using and manipulating their actual lusts or desire, their, their devices and desires of the heart by being students of the heart of another person, and therefore knowing how to play the chords and how to 
appeal to them, what phrases to use and how to manipulate. Sometimes with apparent um, uh, uh, courage and wisdom, but other times with flattery. And you know how that is. Faithful are, this, are the, are the uh, kisses of a, uh, the, the, the wounds of a friend. But deceitful are the kisses of an enemy, you see. Uh, so be very careful about that. It's when a person loves you, the ones who love you most will, sh will be the ones who will tell you the truth. And they'll take a risk in that love, even the risk of hurting the relationship to do it. But here, as a man who is subject because of his vast vanity, I mean, if... 180 days just to show so they could see his marvels and his wealth and so that everybody gets a chance to look at it. Uh, and the, and then the, the appearance of the appearance of generosity when it was actually just a, basically, um, a, uh, a festival of, 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 uh, flattery. There, there's the, Jung talked about the archetypes of the collective unconscious and he was onto something because the Mago Dei, the divine image in God, it's been imprinted upon us, and you cannot help but be a spiritual being. You can't help it. So the atheist, therefore, always lives better than his worldview, because he lives as if there's meaning, value, and purpose, even though his worldview does not allow for any of it. Uh, be because, you see, we are ha God-haunted, whether we like it or not. So we're spiritual beings, we're relational beings, because we're made in his image, and God's a relational being. In fact, the only basis for relationship, because only the divine trinity provides the I and the thou. Because it takes, as you well know, it takes more than one person for there to be love. Otherwise, it's called narcissism. We also, because God is the wellspring of all beauty, we are, in fact, um, aesthetic beings. And he speaks to us through the beauty of nature, if we have ears to hear. The, 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 the mark of God that's behind, behind all things, and we can see that he is um, revealing himself in clear ways. Um, so we bear his image, and just to, and then I'll go right to your point. Um, and so we are also rational beings because he's the source of truth. We are moral beings because he's the wellspring of goodness. We bear his image whether we like it or not, and we're God, God haunted. The only question is going to be what do we do about him? Because we can suppress the truth and unrighteousness, and that's where we go with Romans 1 makes it clear that God reveals himself through the beauty of a world, even though it's fallen. Nevertheless, he, it's there. And now science and technology are force multipliers of worship, wonder, and awe, if we have eyes to see and ears to hear. But at the same time, though, he offers us an, uh, um, um, a genuine offer because he underwrote the cost himself, pursues us, woos us, and calls us to himself. But he also accords us the vast dignity of, of, of response hyphen ability. You are able to respond, and therefore your response ability gives you that dignity. You're not a robot. You're not, it's not kismet. It's not fatalism. You're not uh, someone who's just a puppet. This is a divine human mystery again. How it is that God can be sovereign over all things. And yet, we also are agents whose choices have a moral agency that really will be so. It transcends the mysteries of time and space in many ways, because there never could have been another plan. So here we see in this scripture, the larger, this, this is the only thing big enough to encompass the human condition. So these are stories that echo, don't they, and reverberate. And that's why I say the stories, the motifs, the themes in this book could well be placed in another setting and be convincing. You could, as long as you had a, a powerful monarch, any, anywhere you have, and there's plenty of them all, all along the way, and you could twist it enough to where it wasn't painfully obvious. But it's like a Hitchcock thing. I would have loved to see uh, a, a great director turn, turn Esther into a film. But it wouldn't be, so, right, it wouldn't be wearing it on the sleeve. You say It wouldn't be Esther. It'd be another thing, you see. Uh, but uh, you get the idea. But there are certain themes, aren't there, that resonate. The hubris of man um, and these, the, 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 the battle of the sexes that started with the curse of the fall. Because her desire will be for her husband, but she, he will rule over her. So immediately, you didn't have that disharmony. 
They were com complementary. The man and the woman completed and complemented each other. That's why they were different, and you want that difference. But at the same time, uh, the battle began then as a result when, she, when uh, the woman uh, takes the fruit and then gives it to her husband's right next to her, the silence of Adam. Why, why didn't he say anything? So the whole problem, this is nothing new. There are motifs that recur, aren't there, throughout history. And I do not understand, I cannot say why this happened or that happened. And, and, but you know very well that your life is hanging on a thread. You just think that you're permanent. You have the illusion of that. How many times did somebody look at this phone on your drive over here and it looking at the wrong moment could have hit you? You see, I just the other day, I was uh, heading north on Roswell Road, make, making a right turn at um, on Windsor Parkway. There's a Popeyes there and I, I, I'm a nice guy. And there was a big SUV and he wanted out. So I, uh, the light was red. And so I said, I'll let you in front of me. So there, there he was. So when the light turns green, uh, he, go, he the SUV goes through the light. I go through the and then I hear right behind me, ah, honk, bam! Somebody must have pulled out of the Popeyes, thinking that he too was going to be out there. I don't know what happened. I didn't get to see it, but I kept on driving because I didn't see the accident. <laughs> but what it just it reminded me of is that one second here, one inch there, you do not know. You do not have an understanding. You must grasp this truth. Remember how I, I like to say that you have to believe two things in order to trust God enough to obey him? What are the two things you have to believe? This went through very well. But we'll do. <laughs> His sovereignty. His sovereignty. His sovereignty is good, but that's not. Well, it is good. It's good because God's in control. That's his sovereignty. So God's in control. And by the way, you're not. Yeah. The, the corollary follows. You don't control. You like to think you're in control. You don't control anything. You just have the illusion of control. We construct worlds around us and protect ourselves from the ups and downs of weather and so forth with our technologies, but you still don't control anything. So that's the first, first lesson to learn. And many people don't get it for a while until they finally realize, I'm not in control. I thought of, of, of this business deal. Forget, I don't control one second. Secondly, what's the other thing you have to believe? And we, that's true, but uh, exactly. He loves us, which means what? The corollary? You don't know what your best interests are. That's the hard one. Come on, don't you think you know what your best interests look like? And don't your prayers reflect that? As I like, I'm fond of putting it this way for many people, I know I've done it before, but it's a strategy session. I bet you could do this. With God, in which we give God generous, to, uh, well, we tell him what our best interests look like, first of all. Surely this is my best interest. And then give him generous hints as to when and how to pull them off. <laughs> so that is not prayer. It's trying to manipulate God to get what you do. That's, that's uh, folly. You don't know. You see three courses of action. One road, obviously, is the high road. So that's the one we're going to take. And then it turns out the high road was it was a dead end. And then you had the privilege of turning back and getting back where you started and taking another road. It doesn't look as good, but it turned out that that might not be a cul-de-sac. You see my point? Wisdom is the art of staying off dead end streets. You don't have enough time to keep on making these going off, uh, off and missing your exit on the turnpike or whatever it is. Um, see, I, I, it's my old terminology, the turnpike, instead of the interest, interstate, you see, that's, I grew up in the 50s. But at any rate, um, this idea is you don't control and you don't know. You think you know what your best interests you look like? Think about your prayers. If most of them had been answered the way you wanted and when you wanted them, you'd be ruined. <laughs> so isn't there a Western country Western song, Thank God for an Answered Prayer? Yeah, I think there is. I don't know who did it. Who is it? Garth Brooks did it. Okay, that's a good name because I do. I I often thank God for unanswered prayer. The things I wanted younger and so would have ruined me. And if you stop and think about that, you have to invite God to to actually give you His spirit of discernment and wisdom to listen to it and respond to it and resonate because then you can let loose of that illusion.
Uh, so the providential work of God is upon us. And recognize if you ask the Spirit to guide you and show you and become more attuned to that, um, speak, Lord, for your servant is, is listening. And listening to the Spirit. Remember my little trilogy? I, I do it in the reverse order. Walk by the Spirit, abide in the Son, and trust in the Father. I, I go back and forth with those two. So and then I'll say, um, abide in the Son, walk by the Spirit. Tr abide, uh, uh, abide in the Son, trust in the Father, back and forth. Because you see, that's what you're doing. Your relationship with the Father is trust. The relationship with the Son is to draw your life from. The relationship with the Spirit is to walk in step and keep in step with His prompts. The, the way you amplify the voice of God is by obedience. Obedience is a portal of divine disclosure. The more you want to know Him, do what He calls you to do, then you'll know Him better. And He makes that promise in John 14.